and he will talk about entanglement and emergent geometry from large matrices. Wonderful. Thank you uh, for coming. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, it's always a pleasure, of course, to be in Paris. Good. So I am going to talk about uh, what Blaise just said, entanglement and emergent geometry from large matrices, mostly based on uh, this paper with my student, uh, Alex. Uh, but um, a lot of the machinery uh, was developed in these earlier papers, one also with Alex and one with my ex-student, Shishi. Uh, Good, so what is the point? So we know, we've known for a long time that the main point about the Hawking entropy, the Hawking-Beckenstein entropy, is that it's really big. Right? In particular, it goes like the area, which is maybe nowadays not too, too surprising, but it goes like one over uh, Newton's constant, which in a weekly couple of regime, Newton's constant is small, and so this is a very big entropy. And now we also know that this is not just black holes, it's black holes, uh, Ryu, Taki, and Agi. And so if I take some surface in space time, the split space into some region X and X bar, and then there's an entanglement entropy across between these two regions. Uh, that, goes like, that goes like this, where A is the area of this region. Now, in the normal field theory, we just turned off gravity and we think of uh, your favorite field theory as that space in the ground state is local. There will also be an aerial or entanglement. So the idea that the entanglement goes like the area is, is pretty, is, is fine. And the area will be in some units of some cutoff. Um, some UV cutoff of your of your field theory. But what, what does not appear here is one over some coupling constant of the field theory, okay, with the coupling constant going to zero when the field theory is weakly coupled. So once again, perhaps the most strange thing about this entropy is that it's really big. Okay, we know the black hole entropy is very, is very big. Okay. So it would be really nice to have a model where like a, micros a proper microscopic first principles quantum mechanical model where you could, where something like this would happen. Okay, the coupling constant would appear inversely in the, in the entry. So, uh, and it seems plausible that uh, this kind of effect is tied up with the fact that in gravity, the space itself emerges. It's not just a field theory on a fixed background, but the background itself has to be built as part of the theory. And so uh, a natural thing to wonder is whether this kind of thing arises Uh, that I'm going to use. And so our best That's understood well, model of emergent space uh, tend to involve large matrices. If so, for example, n equals four super mills involves large matrices, uh, C plus one two-dimensional string theory involves large matrices. In all the cases I think that we have the best understanding of uh, space emerges from large matrices where the large n Degrees of freedom in the matrices have to rearrange themselves into local space time. Okay. 
course, if space is emergent, that means that the microscopic Hilbert space does not have spatial locality in it. And that means you're going to have to think a little bit to define what you mean by a spatial factorization in the microscopic theory that doesn't have space. Right? Space is a property of the state, not of the theory. Right? The theory is not that we have emergent space by definition. The Hamiltonian is not local. Locality is a property of the ground state. Okay. Good. So the model I'm going to use is a matrix quantum mechanics. So let's just write down the classical Hamiltonian. Uh, so there's a trace because this is not a quantum mechanical trace. This is just a matrix trace. They're going to be a bunch of matrices Xi, or I is one, two, and three. So I have the three matrices. And these matrices all have conjugate momenta. I, I, but also matrices, these are permission matrices. And so the Hamiltonian is just the momenta squared plus some potential of these matrices. So these are n by n Hermitian matrices. These are the conjugate momenta. This is just a, a vanilla quantum mechanical Hamiltonian. Okay, you could give it to a undergraduate. Okay, just, just normal Hamiltonian, no quantum field theory, and no nothing. Okay, this model has a symmetry, has a UN symmetry. Uh, now, because we're doing Hamiltonian formalism, uh, the natural thing to write are the generators. And so the uh, n squared, all the n squared to a and b run over the indices. Right? So this is a x, i, a, b. a and b run over the indices of the matrix. Generators are 2i, uh, thank you. This uh, is the matrix, x, i. Well, this is not a quantum mechanical commutator, it's a matrix commutator. Okay, so these are matrix in the quantum theory, these will be matrices of operators. Uh, but just you can think of this classically, okay? This is this big bunch of harmonic oscillators, well, big bunch of uh, oscillators in the big matrix. Um, this guy cross on commute to the Hamiltonian, and so they conserve charges. So if we now in string theory, normally when you get this kind of thing, uh, it's natural to gauge this symmetry. And that means that the physical states should be annihilated by the type of generators. So that's the setup. So all I have to do now is tell you what the potential is, and then we're just going to go ahead and solve. A and B are indices on X. And yes, they're the rate, so they're, they're, they they go from one to n. Yes. Ah. I I goes from one to three. The three going to be three by three matrices, and A and B go from one to n. Sorry. So let me write down the potential, and then I'll sort of motivate a little bit. So the potential is going to have this form. It's going to be a perfect square. It's going to be a parameter nu. And some of you may recognize this. Where square means to square the ij indices. So why this potential? So this arises. Um, so this potential is supersymmetrizable. <clears throat> Super simple. And uh, but we're not going to do that. I'm just going to consider the bosonic theory. But this is the bosonic sector of a supersymmetric matrix quantum mechanics. And the, the supersymmetrized version is sometimes called mini BMN, the mini BMN theory. Whereas some of you may know. The BMN matrix quantum mechanics is one of the maximally, it's a deformation of the BFSS and it's very, very supersymmetric. Okay. But um, yeah, this is just a nice, it's going to be a nice potential, but it's connected to respectable uh, supersymmetric models. And in particular, it can be thought of as a toy model uh, for, the, for, the, for this BMN model. Good. So I'm going to spend a bit of time now solving this model. Um, that's not actually the main point of our, our paper. We, we, our point was to use some results of the solution. But uh, so this solution is all going to be all about fuzzy spheres. And so 20 years ago, fuzzy spheres were sort of bread and butter of, of, of uh, high energy uh, theory. 
But I think the younger people don't know what a fuzzy sphere is, so I want to spend some time like, going through what, what a fuzzy sphere is and how it arises from this world. So for people who know what a fuzzy sphere is, my apologies. It's, if I don't tell you what it is, the rest of the talk is kind of pointless, so we're going to do that. What's the parameter G going to be? The coupling constant is what? Uh, well, there's, there's no, it's going to, there's going to be an emergent Maxwell theory. Oh, sorry, who asked the question? Yeah. yeah. So the low energy part of this theory is going to be described by a Maxwell theory on an emergent two sphere across time. And that two sphere will have a coupling, that Maxwell theory will have a coupling, and it's going to be this G. Does, does it go to N or no? Yeah, it's not true. Uh, yes, I'm new. Yeah. New. New and then. So, um, so there's going to be, yeah, sorry. I mean, uh, like if. This is very schematic. If it involves N, like one over G, I could think of it as also, or I could think of the coupling as one over C in some conformal field theory, and if C goes like N, then we know this. No, 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 no. Uh, yeah, so think of it more like in a tooth coupling in N equals four. So something that's finite in the large end, finite but small right. in the large end. Uh, is the is the gauge necessary or this? No, actually, I don't think it's very it's very necessary. No. So we're going to be using the ground state, and the ground state is invariant under this, so it doesn't matter. In fact, yeah, I mean, I'm going to talk a lot about the Maxwell constraint, but um, I think in some sense it's not necessary. Yeah, like okay, the ground state just is rotationally invariant. And it's fine. Conceptually, this gauge constraint is quite useful. But, uh, yeah, so. Is it divergent? Say for new equal field, it should be very divergent. Yes? Uh, maybe that's uh, actually, you know what? <laughs> yeah, the new goes, I actually not, I think it's actually so in these matrix quantum mechanics, um, for example, in BFSS, which is the maximum supersymmetric one, the massless limit does have a normalizable ground state. Uh, in this model, I actually uh, I'm not going to take the new goal to zero limit, but I, I think this actually may not be, there might be some disagreement. I, it's believed that not that there's a supersymmetric argument that it does not have a normalizable ground state in this limit, but then some numerics found a normalizable ground state, so I'm, I'm not sure what the status is. But yes, a very, but just to be clear, right, when the new goal to zero limit, the potential is zero when the matrices commute, and so you might expect there would be a non-normalized, that there wouldn't be a normalizable ground state, and I think there isn't. We're going to take, but so actually this relates to this question. So there are two parameters in this model, nu and n. Okay. What's going to, what's going to happen is the large n limit is going to be the limit where the ground state becomes a smooth sphere. Okay, so that's going to be the emergent geometry. And there's going to be a, a large new limit. It also involves some n's, but a large new limit is going to be when the physics on this emergent sphere is weakly coupled. Okay, so large nu. So what's going to happen? N goes to infinity is a sort of the geometric limit. Then mu goes to infinity is a semi-classical limit. Roughly, some there's some edges to the basic limit. So indeed, I don't want to. So that's what's going to be nice about this model is that you can solve it in the large new limits. Right. So the main problem. These matrix quantum mechanics is that typically you cannot solve them. Yeah. Okay, that, that's so we, we want to be somewhere where it's solvable but still has something uh, interesting happening. Excellent, good, thank you for the questions. All right, so I'm going to tell you, and we'll see later, but just believe me for now, that large new is a semi classical limit. So, semi classically, what should we do? Well, let's just find the classical ground state uh, first. So, the classical uh, ground state. <clears throat> so you have, um, right, this is like quantum mechanics, right? So there's some potential, you know, n squared particles in this potential. Classically, the ground state is when the momentum is zero and the particle just sits at the minimum, right? So what is the minimum? We've got pi is zero and we just minimize this potential. It's an exact square, so the minimum is just when this thing in the inside is zero. And so xi classical, XJ classical is I new epsilon I J K X K. 
So this that is the minimum of this. I moved some F1 around. Uh, actually, I didn't look good. So this you recognize, right? This is obviously the SU2 commutation relations. And so, but these are n by n matrices, right? They're not Pauli matrices, they're n by n matrices. So what we have to the ground state is given by n-dimensional representations of SU2. That's just what these matrices, same way that the particle just sits in the minimum, these matrices just sit at a certain classical matrix up to, of course, these UN rotations. Right. So let's just, so the ground state is just X classical I is new, so we have this parameter, uh, J I, where the J's form a representation of SU2 n dimension. Now, there's some choice here. Uh, we are going to take the uh, irreducible, that's, that, that's going to be the, the biggest sphere. So we're going to take the n dimensional uh, UF of SU2. <clears throat> Semi classically, so it's a leading order large n, they're all equally good. In the supersymmetric theory, especially in the BMN theory, they're all protected and these correspond to parallel brains and so on. In the bosonic theory, there is tunneling between these different minima. And actually, the state I'm going to talk about is not actually the ground state of the quantum theory. It's metastable, but it lives for a very long time. Uh, our universe may also be metastable. We don't worry about that too much. Okay. So strictly speaking, in the quantum theory, the state I'm about to tell you about is a large and metastable state. Uh, but that could probably be fixed by supersymmetrizing everything, which actually we did a bit in the first paper with Shizia. Uh, but okay, that's just what it is. So I'm gonna, so so I can just write down these matrices for you. So this may even be familiar. So that's, I think it would be a J three, and I'm gonna write down a J minus, which is J one minus I J two. And so this is like the angular momentum J three, except there are n of them. When n is large, it basically goes from n over two down to minus n over two. There's some shifts by one. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Um, okay, so this is like your this is the f little m right of, of uh, SU two, and j minus you also know is a lowering operator. Right? So, So that it has zeros along the diagonal and some entries along the lower diagonal. The nth one is little n. N minus n squared. So that's the nth entry along the lower diagonal has, has this form. This, this, this particular thing is going to be useful later. Okay, but this is some angular momentum representation theory, and that's the thing. That's the entry. Of course, they're all non zero. Okay, n is the one, two, three, four, <laughs> the nth, middle nth, one. J plus is the conjugate of J minus. All right. So these matrices are called the fuzzy sphere. And so uh, let me tell you why. Uh, I mean, maybe the, the first, as you know, the, the generators <clears throat> of there's a Casimir for, for this representation, right? So <clears throat> x1 squared, so excuse the horrible notation, x3 squared is new squared n squared over four. Okay, and so indeed these x, y, and z matrices obey something that looks a bit like a sphere. Okay, like a big radius new n over two sphere. But to really, to really see that mm -hmm. this ground state has a sphere in it, um, the nicest thing to do is look at the fluctuations about the ground state. So is anyone happy with the, with the ground states? Anyone not happy with the ground states? <laughs> so uh, let's look at fluctuations. So let's let x i be x i classical plus some a i. Right? So we're gonna look now, we have Hamiltonian, right? We found the ground state. And now classically, we can just look at the little oscillations about the ground states. Okay. 
Um, all right, so, well, so these are a bunch of matrices that depend on, on time. What I'm going to tell you is that these, that these matrices can be mapped onto certain functions, and these functions live on a sphere. And so the way of, to do that is to take, take AI, it's a matrix, and expand it in a certain basis of matrices. They're going to be labeled by J and M. So these are a bunch of coefficients, and this is some special basis of matrices. Okay. Take a matrix, we're going to expand in some basis. These things are called matrix square harmonics, and they obey J3 y hat Jm is M y hat Jm J uh, Ji Ji y hat is L L plus one <coughs> y hat. So obviously these are supposed to look like what the square harmonics normally obey. And indeed, in this game of non commutative geometry, which is what I'm doing, uh, commutators are like derivatives. I think commutators obey a Leibniz rule, just like derivatives do. And, and so the natural matrixy version of a derivative is a commutator. But so, the, uh, and M uh, goes from minus J to J. But J does not go to infinity because these are completely finite objects, it's cut off by M. And so at the end of the day, you can think of, we're going to see that you can think of these matrices as spherical harmonics that are cut off in momentum space. <clears throat> so you have to believe me, you can solve these equations very explicitly and you get a bunch of set, a basis of matrices and you can expand any matrix, any Hermitian matrix in terms of these. Okay. Now, why should we do this? Well, why do you normally expand things in a basis if the basis has some nice symmetries that your background has and so that the equations of motion simplify in that basis, right? Like before you transform, you have translation invariance and so on. Okay. Um, so now you can do the following. You can define a function, little ai of theta and phi, that's defined to be, I take the same, I just take these coefficients, the same ones, but I replace these with the regular spherical harmonics. Okay. And so this is a map. This is cut off at N. There's a map between, given a matrix, expanded in a basis, I can build a function with the same coefficients. Okay, so there's a map between matrices and functions. Now, what's a bit unusual is these functions have to be cut off. If I take a function that's, whose angular momentum is cut off, and I multiply it by another function whose angular momentum is cut off, the multiplication is going to have angular momentum going up to 2m. Okay? So these functions had better not multiply with the normal multiplication. But that's fine. They come from matrices, and matrices obey a non commutative multiplication. Okay? So the multiplication of these functions is inherited from these matrices, and that's called the star product. So, okay. so it turns out that if you take this expansion, you expand it to quadratic order, you plug it into the Hamiltonian, you expand it in this way, you get a bunch of the Hamiltonian in terms of these coefficients, and then you introduce these functions, you can rewrite the Hamiltonian as a local integral over these functions up to the star product. Okay, so the Hamiltonian, the quadratic Hamiltonian for fluctuations, it turns out can be written very nicely in terms of these status. Uh, and the answer is uh, new, some integral over a two sphere. Okay. Okay, sorry, there's a little technical thing that's just let me just mentioned. So this has this is there are three functions here, right? It's natural to split it into the one normal to the sphere and the one's tangent to the sphere, right? So I'm gonna call phi the function, the one normal to the sphere where n is just the vector x, y, z, the normal, normalized. Um, and then I'm going to build uh, b is going to be n cross a. Those are the directions <coughs> tangent to the sphere. Okay. And from this b, it's also natural to build a field strength, which is the scalar now, which is curl of b. 
don't worry too much. I've had three components. I group there's a normal, a normal one that's going to describe fluctuations of the sphere, and there's a, a tangent one, which is naturally written as a magnetic field on the on the sphere. Okay, that's, that's what happens. So and what, what you get is a half the momentum conjugate to B, which is this sort of this uh, A, this is the electric field, <coughs> the momentum conjugate to the scalar. F minus five squared plus a half rad phi squared. Okay, so where the subtlety, the only subtlety is that these squares are not regular multiplication, they're this star product multiplication. Mm -hmm. okay. There needs to be a different multiplication because you need to preserve the fact that it's truncated in, in N. But putting that aside for the moment, and we're about to take a larger limit where that's going to go away. This is a low up, up this multiplication. This is a field theory on a two sphere with you know, pretty normal kind of terms. Okay, so and this is the this is what the fuzzy sphere does for you. Okay, so the fluctuations. This model that we started with had no geometry, no locality. It was just three matrices. The low energy, the, the fluctuations about the ground state, can be written as fluctuations on an emergent uh, two sphere. Excuse me. Yes. But well, there should be, of course, some complicated Jacobian. Uh, no, what well, a large end, I think this is not, uh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> uh, no, so yeah, so I haven't done, there's no path integral. I just, there's no path integral involved. I've just taken the Hamiltonian. And no, it's literally what I said. You take the Hamiltonian, you plug in this expansion, and you can just rewrite it like this. It's an identity. In fact, it, it doesn't even need to be, it's actually, it's actually exact, in fact. There's no, there's no, there's no, uh, no, there's no Jacobian. And so this, this, uh, so this map, this, this is called the Moyal map. <coughs> and uh, so one of the, so, right. So in general, the way it goes is that matrices become functions, uh, traces become integrals, and uh, commutators become derivatives. Okay, that, that's uh, If you take uh, some reducible uh, representation for the local, uh, yeah. two big representations, for example. Uh, so that's right. So then, then right, it's a bit. So you have some choice. So then you have basically have a block. Let's say you split it up. For example, the simplest one might be two equal size representations. Then this corresponds to two uh, coincident deep brains. And so this will be an SU2. You get an SU, you start getting a non-abelian theory. So indeed, so for people who were uh, cognizant 20 or so years ago, what I'm just describing is called the Myers effect. <clears throat> so I, I didn't invent any of this. Okay, this, this is the long, old, old stuff. Um, and in the string theory versions, you, you have N D0 brains and they polarize into a D2 brain. <clears throat> and so what we've derived here is the world volume theory of this D2 brain. But indeed, depending on the setup, you can have multiple parallel E2 brains, and then you get non abelian and non abelian theories. Yeah, so that couple, couple quick things about this theory. I mean, again, this is all background because the whole point, I'm not actually going to do calculations in this theory, I'm going to do calculations with the matrices. Okay, I want to do a microscopic calculation, but this is all an extended motivation, right? So this theory has an emergent two sphere in it. This emergent two sphere has a scalar field and a U1 gauge field living on it. Where did the U1 symmetry come from? This is a really, I think I've really appreciated, uh, but very, I think quite cool thing. So the original theory had an SUN symmetry. So how did that go? So XI went to U, XI U dagger. Let's write u is e to the i t. Let's take that, uh, right? And then so xi was x classical plus a. So let's put that in, conjugate that, and expand out the t. Uh, I missed it. So I should have written this here, there. And so this becomes, well, e so e to the i t, x classical plus a e to the minus i t. 
We expand out the T in the X classical plus I commutative of T X classical uh, plus uh, A plus high order terms. So the gauge transformation of A is like that. If you think of this as a background, A maps to little a, right, to our field. What does this map to? Well, T maps to some other function lambda. And I told you that commutators map to derivatives. So under the Moya map, this thing becomes D lambda. Okay, so the U1 gauge transformation is inherited from the SUN gauge transformation. Okay. So that, that's, question is, yeah, yes. the, this kind of large and limits work well in the top limit. Yes, we know the Figuji Kawaii mechanism, but I, as far as I remember about well, these models, it's not exactly the, the top limit. No, I, I wonder if, thank you, good. So I have to take two limits, good, perfect. So the two limits. So in the n goes to, first I'm gonna take n goes to infinity. In this limit, that is where these star products become normal products, okay? And then that's where you get a smooth, and not you fuzz out the fuzzes, okay, smooth, so it becomes a smooth uh, S, S2. And now let me talk about the, the other limit. Actually, they, well, we're gonna see it in two ways, but the way that's most relevant now is uh, this F, Okay, then the F in, in under the Moya under the Moya map becomes uh, what D A plus the commutator of A with A star, and there's a coupling here. So normally in a U1 theory, this term of course vanishes. But if you have a non-commutative U1, which sounds contradictory, but it's not okay, it's still a U1, but uh, the multiplication that doesn't is not commutative, uh, then you still have this term. And this coupling here uh, is uh, 4 pi uh, n mu cubed. And so this is the natural Maxwell coupling. And um, this is also going to go to uh, what to zero. Okay, so that's this is like the truth coupling in the model. So yeah, I'm not understanding. You had the definition of F there, which was not the which was linear in A. And now it has become something else. So it's a there's a derivative here. Uh let's see. Yeah, how did uh, no, yeah, these are derivatives on a sphere. And, and when you when you sort of write them, it's, it's because all these things have to be projected back onto the sphere. So so they're, they're uh yeah, wait, let me see. You know, you've got a good. Uh... Let me think about it. It, it, it definitely is this, but. Um... 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 Yeah, I think this is all, this was all a leading order in the. I mean, it's a, it's a tech, yeah, I promise you there's this term. Maybe this was leading order as, uh, you know, star goes to one. I mean, this comes directly from the commutator squared term in Hamilton, right? So the F, this, this F squared comes from the commutator squared term and that definitely has a A to the fourth. So that there definitely is an A to the fourth in the Hamiltonian. So I think I think this probably involved the simplification. Yeah, so can you state the hierarchy between n u and your new coupling? You have some a, a. order of difference, right? You have you want the geometry, so n u is uh, large. Okay, so n is large, and I thought uh, n u determined the yeah. geometric nature of your yeah. That's right. Yeah, and isn't there a hierarchy? Between these two? <clears throat> yes, it doesn't matter. Well, the, in the regime I'm in, mean, it's both going to be large, uh, and it's not, there's actually not too much subtlety with the order limits. Ooh, yeah. I still don't understand the previous, uh, my previous question. So, uh, if you pass to here to angular variables, essentially, yes, yes. On the sphere, 
the spherical variables, and you say that there is no uh, Jacobian involved. <coughs> very unusual. To me. So there's no, there's no, I'm not, there's no measure, right? It's just, I'm just taking the Hamiltonian. Wait, but, uh, so this is okay. from So the, these terms come from the pi i term in the in the uh, in the mac pi squared. This term comes in the commutators. I mean, it 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 it's it, it's it's. Uh, well, I understand what you're saying, but uh, for your your uh, Yeah, but I'm good. Yeah. So one one thing I could do is take the classical Hamiltonian, do this map. Uh, and then I'll just well, quantize this model anymore. Uh, yeah. Okay. Maybe we can talk about it more. I, I don't. I'm not aware that there's a subtlety with the with the loop. How much? Uh, uh, so where would you like it to? So uh, uh, when you pass to to angular variables like this, phi, uh, d, etc., it's obviously. Uh, uh, the nonlinear change of variables, so you have to add uh, a Jacobian. If you yeah, but these are pi. Uh, the question is, what is the conjugate on the pi? Yeah. Right. 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 Oh, sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, so good. So, so. Maybe, maybe let me write down the wave function. Maybe maybe it's going to help with, with this question. I think actually, uh, I think it might help. Okay, so we'll right, so let me give me let me come back to this uh, point. So uh, right, okay. So this is really the start. So this is the background, and so I want to calculate an entanglement entropy uh, in the matrix formulation of this of this model. Okay, this is all just a sort of a motivation. Okay, good. So we're going to calculate the entanglement and, and we're going to find a contribution that goes like an area over this Maxwell. Over this Maxwell. So, so, firstly, we have to think about how to partition matrices. So as I said at the beginning, because space is emergent, but when you have a quantum field theory that's local, <coughs> up to issues with UV divergences, it's obvious what to do, right? There's some box space here, there's some box space there. You keep the operators that are supported on one side and you integrate out the ones that are not, okay? So with the matrices, you don't have space, so you don't know, suppose, that, so I told you there's a fuzzy sphere. Say I want to somehow, say I have access to this region, but I want to integrate out this region, okay? I should probably be tracing over some of the matrices, sorry, some of the oscillators, but I don't know which ones, because there's no locality in the model. So uh, the, the point here came from a proposal by Das Kaushal Randall and Trivedi a couple of years ago now. Um, that's going to be the starting point for what I, what I do. So they made the following, my interpretation of the main point of this paper is, is that they made the following observation, which I think is quite nice. So this model had three matrices, okay? Now, if you have just a model with just one matrix, then you can diagonalize that matrix, right? So it's like a C equals one model. And when you can diagonalize it, then you have a bunch of eigenvalues. And, you know, that's just a many body problem. And you can say, well, some of the eigenvalues live there, some of the eigenvalues live there. You just partition the eigenvalues, the ordered eigenvalues, and, and you're fine, okay? It's like partitioning particles in quantum mechanics. But you have more than one matrix, they don't commute. You cannot diagonalize all of them, and it's less obvious what you're supposed to do. Okay, so the problem, right? So the, the, when you have more than one matrix, they don't commute generically, and so you cannot reduce the problem to eigenvalues, and then, well, okay, you don't know what to do, all right? So they pointed out the following. Um, this goes to the commutative case. Say I have uh, three matrices and I want to you know, define some region uh, sigma in, in, in space. 
the way I would do that again with just normal coordinates is I would define some function f of sigma that is uh, less than f zero, and that so for example this could be x <coughs> squared plus y squared plus z squared uh, minus one. Okay, and then if this is less than f zero, this defines a sphere with a, a ball, so with with radius. Um, uh, square root of f zero, or I can take f to be x. Right, so this this would define a ball. If this is just x, that would define half of space, and so on. Right, so any region, I could define a region with a function like that. Everyone happy? Let's call this f. Yeah. Any region, define the function. So to define a region, you only need one function of your three matrices. Okay, and so it's very natural then to take whatever region you want, take the function, and then map that to a matrix. So if any function can be mapped to a matrix, right? And then one function you can diagonalize, right? And so the idea is uh, you, so uh, you upgrade uh, to matrices. I'll say something about ordering in a second. So you upgrade to matrices. So for example, if you are interested in a sphere, you define the matrix F as the matrices x squared plus y squared, or whatever you want. Okay. So given any function, so given a region, you have a function that defines that region, <clears throat> replace all the coordinates of matrices. Okay, and you get a matrix. All right. Now again, forget about ordering for a moment. So so then you have a region. This now defines a preferred basis, which is where this f is diagonal. So you have a basis where f is diagonal, and also you order the eigenvalues, right? So f um, in some particular state is uh, <coughs> f0, fm, fm plus 1. Fn, so I should have called this f0 to c. Um, so I'll order the eigenvalues, and for some particular set of matrices x, y, and z, there'll be a particular eigenvalue that's less than c, and a set of eigenvalues that are bigger than c, and this defines a subspace of the matrices. <coughs> and so now I can write down all the other matrices, for example, x1 has no reason to be diagonal in this basis, right? It's just a different matrix, okay? <clears throat> so X1 looks something like this, and so all, all of them, right? So the proposal of these guys is that these oscillators live inside the region. These ones live outside the region, and then, okay. <laughs> Uh, they got a bit confused about what to do with these ones, okay? And they made some proposals, uh, which um, we're going to do better than that, okay? But 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 this is the idea, okay? So the, I think the main what I took from this paper is that you only need one matrix to define a region, and one matrix you can diagonalize. Once you can diagonalize a matrix, you know what to talk. About. Yes. Yeah, uh, well, well, maybe it's too late, maybe it's the same, I don't know. So you already have sphere and uh, spherical homomorphism. In principle, if you have a region, you can consider just uh, functions with final support. Yeah, it's, it's the same. It's <coughs> different modes, and it's the same basis. Yeah, it's basically the same. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there's some fuzziness up to this issue of the, but, but yes, it, it, that's right. This is very similar to what, that, what, yeah, what you just said. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Um, uh, Sorry. Yeah, okay, so you can diagonalize one matrix. Once you can diagonalize a matrix, you know what to do. Now, a brief comment about that is not also not really addressed in this paper is that, you know, <coughs> matrices don't compute, right? And, but functions do. So, you know, the region x squared, y squared, you know, is the same as y squared x, but for matrices, that's not true, right? And so there's a non uniqueness in this okay. lift. Due to the ordering ambiguities when you quantize something, it's a quantize. So what that suggests, and what we're going to do, although I'm not going to, I'm not going to have time to talk about it, we're actually going to coarse grain. So we're going to have a function, and we're going to coarse grain over the non commutative piece. So we shouldn't. So it's said differently. 
because if you could partition the microscopic observables in a way that was in one-to-one -one correspondence with the space, then the space wouldn't be emergent. It would be there in the microscopic theory, right? And the space has no, then it wouldn't be emergent. And this is, <laughs> so if space is emergent, you have no right to have a precise partition of your microscopic number space that corresponds to the emergent locality because the locality is emergent, right? And so the entanglement that I'm going to calculate at the end of the day is going to be coarse grained over some scale that's precisely going to eliminate this ordering ambiguity. Okay, so the, this partition is only we only well defined up to these ordering ambiguities, and we're going to coarse grain over that scale later. And you say so just schematically probably you know, there are some uh, corners and some matrix, but uh, you choose different uh, areas on the sphere. So is it, it's yeah, let me uh, let me crazy uh, invading. Uh, let, let me be very. I think this is what you're asking. Let me be, let me be very specific. The sphere. So we we want to if we have the sphere and we want to partition this cap. Mm. This is this is the z of the x three direction. Right, so we're going to take out the function. It's going to be x three. You know, is some some constant. Remember, in the basis I wrote the solution, x three was already diagonal. I should have erased them. X three was minus n over two, all the way down to n over two. And so, uh, this is some critical C. And so you can think so roughly the picture you can have in mind is that these different eigenvalues correspond to different unit area, unit area um, ribbons on the, on, the, on, the, on the sphere. And so if we, we're going to partition the nth one, uh, so we're going to keep m, and that's going to correspond to going some distance m right roughly uh, down, yeah, down from, so this is n over two. Well, this whole thing is uh, n, new n. Does that address? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's very clear. Yeah, usually, when you define the parallel entropy of the ratio, you have to speak with this text in the process of product, one answer to the ratio, and one answer to the complement of the ratio. Yeah, the process of product is a reverse test with the yeah. direct sum. Ah, okay, so good. Speak. So, that, that, that's actually yes. So, this is a 10. So, let me just check. Your question doesn't concern these guys, even for the eigenvalues, you could ask what you just said, right? If I have, say I have two particles in a uh, harmonic oscillator. Framework, yeah, yeah I, I think I know the question. Yeah, it's multiplicative. No, yeah. So, uh, say, say you have quantum mechanics, say you have two, uh, two particles in some <clears throat> potential, normal, normal quantum mechanics. Now, nothing, no matrices. Um, um, right, so, so I have a, right. So, uh, yeah, right. So some potential, let's say I have two particles removing this potential. And so the Hilbert space, right? So they have the wave functions are uh, of x1. So think about the best way to say this right. So general state um, of two particles is some wave function x1, x2, uh, x1. X two and um, so am I doing this? <clears throat> and the issue is exactly what you just said. The Hilbert space is a sum, right? Yeah, as you put, right? Seven percent, right? So there are two particles. The Hilbert space is the sum of the Hilbert space. It's not the product. So that, that's what you're saying, right? And so. When you, when you, so you could ask in quantum mechanics, how do you factorize uh, the Hilbert space? And so what you have to do is embed it in a bigger Hilbert space that's a multi-particle Hilbert space. Okay, so um, for example, if you, right, and so the easiest way to do it is to go to a second quantized description of your Hilbert space with just two particles and that you can partition. Okay, that's what people normally do. So go to a second quantized description now, if you don't want to do that, the best way to do it is to say, so I'm going to partition here, okay? So then what could happen? There could be one particle, there could be two particles on this side, there could be one particle this side, one particle there, or two particles on that side. 
So if I trace out the Hilbert space here, I get a multi-particle Hilbert space on the other side. I could have two, one, or no particles. And so the way to define intensive factorization <coughs> is you have to embed it into these bigger Hilbert spaces that allow the particle number to vary. Once you do that, you can make a factorization. Yeah, if you go to the Fox space. Sorry? If you go to the Fox space. Well, the Fox space of a... So, again, here, you don't have to go all the way... The direct sum of your vector space is the constant for the constant Fox space. So, so, if you don't want to go to a Fox space, you just have two particles, it's enough to go to a space where there could be two, one, or no particles on one side. I'm happy to talk about it. It's, it's, that's not anything new that I'm doing. Okay, so I'm using some very well established structure to partition the quantum mechanics. So don't blame me for this. <laughs> All right. Uh, but yes, you have to go. Right, it has to do with these. <clears throat> to define entanglement, you don't need a tensor product. It's enough to have a sum of tensor products. That's, that's a mathematical structure. Okay. Good. So uh, uh, there's a worse problem than, than this one. And, and that has to do with these off diagonal elements here. And so for these guys, this was uh, sort of a problem. And they said, well, you can put them on this side, you can put them on this side. But actually, sort of the most important point uh, is that this is not a problem. It's not a bug. It's a, it's, a, it's a virtue. It's a very good thing. And it's very interesting. And it's where all the richness uh, comes from. Okay, so the question is what to do with these off diagonal terms. Uh, so, off diagonal. Right, so I'm going to call this block <coughs> sigma sigma, this block sigma bar, sigma bar, and this sigma sigma bar, sigma bar, sigma, the off diagonal uh, blocks. Again, to convince you uh, that what I'm about to do is kosher, I'll tell you that I didn't invent it. So, <laughs> uh, you can go blame somebody else. Uh, so it's very similar, but people have done it in a different context, which has to do with gauge theories. So a very similar problem. So forget again, forget matrices for a second. Let's say you have a Maxwell, a normal Maxwell theory, or a John Simon's theory, or some kind of gauge theory, and you want to associate entanglement entropy to some region X. You have a basic problem, which is that this locality is not consistent with gauge invariance because the gauge invariant observables are Wilson loops that are not localized in some region. Okay, so you have the Wilson loops that live here, you have the ones that live here, those are fine. What are you supposed to do? These, off, these Wilson loops that go through the boundary are very, very analogous to these off diagonal blocks of the matrices. Because if we had an SUN, and here there's an SUM that acts here. And SU n minus m that acts here, but they both act on these off diagonal blocks. Okay. All right. So another way to think about it <coughs> is you have a Gauss law in, in uh, Maxwell theory, and so you have a charge there that has to be a negative charge somewhere else. And, and the Hilbert, the gauge invariant Hilbert space, is does not factorize. Okay. It's not the same as the problem I was just asked about, but it's it's, but it's similar in issue, in issue, a similar issue. The Hilbert space you're given doesn't want to factorize. Okay. For the matrices, let's be very explicit see how that works. So this region has an SUM associated to it. M is the size of this block. <clears throat> let's look at the generators. The Gauss law, the sigma sigma component of this, of this Gauss law. Uh, so that's 2i. And then remember we had x pi, right, with the generators. And so th but these have two indices. So x has got to be sigma, but the second index is being multiplied. So it can run over sigma and sigma bar, right? So one term is sigma sigma, commutator. But there's another term where this index runs over sigma bar, which is um, x i sigma sigma bar. Pi, pi, sigma bar, sigma. Um, so a bit sloppy, so I don't know. Right. Plus, uh, 
So this generates SUM transformations here. But this describes the fact that these off-diagonal terms are charged under these SUM rotations, which they obviously are, right? Because the SUM acts on this bit of the matrix. Right. So I can write this as the generator of SUM, M here, plus some charge is zero. Okay, where the charge is again the charge carried by these off-diagonal modes. The function you choose to describe. This is given. This n, n can be not a given number. Can Whatever you want. Yes, m can be anything. So, so this 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 split is associated to a given function. So, you given split. the function n is not unique. So, say again. Given the function f is not well defined. But what do you mean? It's not fluctuate. No. I'm sorry. It's what? It may fluctuate depending on the space. Um. It, that's that's absolutely right. Yes, this has the that, that that's that yes that that's correct. Yes, yes. Um, we're going to be in this leading semi-classical limit where that's not an issue. But uh, absolutely, this has to be done. Um, it, it's a bit formal. Yes, you're right. But I think but I, I would say it's well defined, but it, it may be tricky to make sense of. Yes, that 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 is true. Right, because I haven't told you these axes are quantum variables, right? So I'm saying you can do this at an operator level, right? But it's it, you know it's, it's not going to be very useful. Good. All right. So let's go back. So all, all I want to say this right is like the get is is analogous to the Gauss law uh, here, right? That it, the, there's a charge carried by these off-diagonal modes, which are like these Wilson loops that are going uh, through through here. They're charged under the gauge transformations that live, that live here. So here's the excuse. Okay, so what people have done, this has been understood now very well. Okay. Uh, but involves something that you may or may not like, which is that you have to extend the Hilbert space of your theory. Okay, so given your Maxwell theory, it has a physical Hilbert space, which is the gauged Hilbert space, okay? And that one just does not factorize, okay? That, that one. So if you want to factorize it, you have to add some degrees of freedom to your theory that are associated to, to the boundary of the region. <clears throat> and there are two ways of thinking about it. One is that you have to add these boundary charges. So you're gonna embed your state into a bigger Hilbert space that has charges living on the boundary where Wilson lines can end. And now I can move this line around Without the outside, okay. Mm -hmm. So, is it called? So you have to add what are called edge modes uh, to right to the theory uh, to the Hilbert space. Another way of thinking about it is that you have here. Let's see here. You have a gauge transformation in your original theory. This gauge transformation does nothing, right? It doesn't exist. It's just, it's just a bad way of writing it. And so that if this, what these edge modes are, are precisely the gauge transformations that don't vanish on this, on this boundary. Okay? So you can think of these edge modes either as these charges or as uh, gauge modes that don't vanish, that live on, on the boundary. So is this, is this known to be a good solution to the problem? Uh, because, yes. Uh, it seems to me like you're just defining a theory in X now. And, uh... No, uh, well that, sorry, no. So you add, so here's what, uh, let me tell you what happens. So, so when you add these modes, you also have to add them on, on X bar. Okay, so you add pairs of them. And you can show that the state in this bigger theory, in order to obey this constraint, these edge modes have to be maximally entangled. Another way to say that, suppose you try to build a reduced, yeah, maybe this is the most compelling, I don't know. Suppose you want to build a reduced density matrix just of the sigma region. So you want to trace out everything, okay. Um, you, you just, that's just not well defined without these modes. With these modes, think of them as fundamentals, like a, a cube. Okay, and so the reduced density matrix is gonna have some some contribution from all the stuff in here. But it's going to have another contribution, which is going to be 
Q, Q summed over all Q. So Q is like a fundamental, so it's a vector, but you can make something uh, age invariant by, by, max, by, by having a maximally with, and this is proportional to the identity. So I'm trying to say that what I'm trying to sh show you here is that when you add these edge modes, you're basically forced to maximally entangle them because the only way you could write down. So firstly, you can write down. Yes, the short answer to your question, it is known that once you add these edge modes, you can define a reduced density matrix. To come back to Giuseppe's point, you can also just ungauge the theory basically, and, and then calculate, then take the trace, get a reduced density matrix and ask what extra terms do you get from starting with this ungauge theory. The extra terms you get are gonna be these, uh, they're gonna be these edge modes, and these edge modes are gonna be, it turns out they're maximally entangled. Okay. Because your state did obey the Gauss law, even if you ungauge the theory, the states that you care about are the ones that obey the Gauss law, and that will force this maximal, uh, this maximal entanglement. Um, is, is there a, a sort of canonical way of adding these? <laughs> yes, I mean, although I, I agree, I, I'm, so don't shoot the messenger, right? So yeah, this is not unique, I think. Okay. Because uh, you're just adding stuff to your yeah. theory. Uh, however, given, let me say two things. So given, given a presentation of the theory, it is normally pretty canonical, right? So for example, the, the gauge transformation, right? I mean, you write down Lagrangian, you know what the gauge transformations are, even though they don't exist. It, 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 it's, so, but I, so I think it's, it's fairly canonical, uh, meaning there's normally sort of an obvious, also with these matrices, that how the SUN, I know how the SUN acts. And so these edge modes are kind of natural, but I, um, so I say fairly canonical. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you do a duality, things might look totally different. Um, but another thing is that in the Chern Simons case, it really does give very sensible. So, so for example, you could do the following start with the lattice theory with no, no U1. So, consider a case where you're gauge, there are the models where you get emergent gauge fields just in, in lattice theories, okay? So, in the UV, you have no problem at all auditioning the lattice. And you could ask, what's the calculation I have to do in the emergent gauge theory that gets the right answer? And it's this one. But I don't know if that's been proved, uh, but in some cases it works. Like, uh, yeah. Sorry, could you say again uh, yes. how much do you have to enlarge in this case? So you need to add the boundary? Basically, it, 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 it amounts to adding, physicalizing, if you like, the, the, the gauge transformations on, on, on that act on the boundary. Yeah. Actually, another thing, they do, right, so they come with the natural symplectic structures, which we need to quantize them when you have a boundary. Um, so it, it's all fairly natural, but I, I don't think it's you. Know, the, 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 the gauge transformation is not punishing. Sean, we, we need to wrap up fairly soon. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Uh, good. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the cutoff, including question, is 15 past. That, that's that's right. Yeah, that'd be a lot of questions, right? So, yes, which is good. Yes. No, 10 minutes. I think 10 minutes. <clears throat> so. Yeah, so don't blame me for this. Okay, I agree it has a slightly a funny feeling to it, but in practice, it ends up being quite a canonical thing. And the answers that you get, from, so for example, in the Chun Simons case, there's this thing called the topological entanglement entropy, which is definitely a well defined thing, and you get it by this procedure. Okay. Right. Good. So, Now let's get back to our model and let's just do this. Okay. So, um, I want to tell you, let's see. So I'll, I'll tell you right, how, a little bit qualitatively how it works. So we're gonna, right, well, there's a wave function. Good. So we have a state, let me start with the state. So the semi-classical to this will also address uh, some questions from earlier. Right, so we um, remember we had x was x classical uh, plus uh, plus some perturbation, and so we we were at the minimum. 
you have some fluctuations. And so the, uh, you can write down the Schrodinger equation with all measure factors involved in writing Laplacians and, and stuff. You diagonalize uh, the, the, the fluctuations and you're gonna get a Gaussian, a Gaussian state. So the wave function, the X, just from solving the linearized Schrodinger equation uh, explicitly is, is a Gaussian weight, and it goes like this. <clears throat> so call that J. So coefficients, choice, X minus X classical, so Y, J, M. So let me talk you through this. This is a wave function on the matrices. It's the, this is the, the the ground, this is the, the fuzzy sphere wave function, right? So the classical state is this, a particular matrix. I'm looking at deviations away from X classical and to quadratic order and fluctuations, that's just a bunch of modes, right? And I expanded the modes in these spherical harmonics. So I'm taking a general matrix, I'm dotting it with a spherical harmonic to pick out the coefficient <clears throat> in the expansion. That mode has, a, has an energy Right. It's just a bunch of harmonic oscillators. Uh, and so the wave function is the harmonic oscillator wave function. So there's a square here. Right. This is just e to the minus a whole bunch of modes. Okay. So I have <clears throat> the classical the fluctuations about the ground state. The classical, the semi classical wave function is just this. Right. So this is the state. And I don't think there's any, any measure ambiguity. Right. I didn't change variables. I just wrote down the matrix quantum mechanics Schrodinger equation. And these are what the distinctions the, the wave function looks like. Okay, so I have a completely definite state. Okay, well, I'm, I'm not, not going to tell you these omegas, but I know them, and I know these matrices as well. Okay, so this is a completely explicit uh, wave, wave function. And as you can see, the ends are sort of hidden, but large new wants to be semi-classical, right? They're more, they're more and more, the wave functions are more and more peaked as, as new, as new gets large. <laughs> Okay, so, um, <clears throat> yeah, good. So with that in mind, let me just maybe tell you in words what, we, what you can do. So there are these matrices, there's a sigma, 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 <clears throat> right, there are these different bits. On this wave function, I can think of that in a wave function of this full space where I don't impose the Gauss law. This wave function does obey the Gauss law. Okay. Uh, I embed it into this bigger Hilbert space and I just trace out these modes and I'm gonna get a density matrix for sigma sigma. <clears throat> this density matrix has the following form. It's the sum of our representations, probability, so just imagine, so I take this wave function, I, I write it as a, a product of itself, I trace out these guys, I get a reduced density matrix. There's an SUM that acts here, but the modes that I traced out were charged under SUM. And so the density matrix that I get is a sum of different representations of SUM corresponding to the different to the, to the state that I traced out that was charged. So I have a sum of representations. I can the, the density matrix is block diagonal in these representations. Each representation comes with an overall probability normalized by its <clears throat> dimension of the representation. And the density matrix is an identity on the gauge theoretic modes. That's this uh, QQ that I talked about before. It's maximally entangled over, these are the edge modes. Okay, the edge modes are the gauge, the SUM pure gauge modes, right? The, the charge, the actual charge modes are maximally entangled. And so there's an identity here. <laughs> Prove that. And then there's some gauge singlet bit that multiplies each representation. Yeah, that's the after the computation, or is it? Yes. Um, that's Actually, it's, a, it's a, like a three line. This doesn't depend on the state. It just depends on the Gauss law. So, so using, using the Gauss law, you, this, this, this follows, yes. It's, it's three lines, but it's three lines too many. I'm uh, happy to do it afterwards. Um, it's, it's, it's really what I said. So 
this state now has some non-gauge invariant modes, but the only way that, that uh, you have to make a gauge invariant density matrix, and the only way you can do that uh, is by maximally entangling these modes. And so each representation has to, another way you can say is that the generators Q has to commute with a reduced density matrix, and then by whoever's lemma, it has to be identity on, on each block. It's, 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 so this follows in the Gauss law. But it's a general, all these calculations, and it's uh, always the case that these edge modes are maximally entangled. So what we did is now we take our state. What we want to, it turns out there's a dominant representation. So in the large n limit, one of these probabilities uh, is much bigger than all the other ones. Okay, this, 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 this these guys transform under a dominant representation of, of SUM. Um, and there's a contribution to the entanglement entropy as the log of the dimension of this dominant representation. And so what we did is calculate this, this dimension and then just two points and then I'll stop. First goes right back to the beginning. Um, we saw that this classical, the classical matrices, so J3 was diagonal, right? And J minus, if you remember, had only things along the lower diagonal. And so there was a term here that was M, N minus M, right? But this was J, J, J minus, <clears throat> was zero. And so almost the off diagonal part of the class, this is, a, this is like the crucial technical point, right? So this, if you take one thing from this talk, beyond the introduction, take this point. So when you have a non commutative geometry defined by the matrices, the off diagonal blocks are very low rank, okay? So this, these, these, the off diagonal part of the X matrices only has a single non-zero entry, okay? And that's a very generic feature of having, having these non commutative geometries. What, so basically what that means, if I think about SUM, the transformations, most of them don't touch these off diagonal blocks because they're not classically, because they're all zero, okay? And that's like saying, coming back to here, the, the edge modes are not all the gauge transformations, they're the gauge transformations that act on the boundary. The gauge transformations that act on the boundary here are the SUM transformations that act on this entry, which is almost none of them. So it's a rank two, it's a very low rank representation of SUM. Knowing that, we can get its dimension from its Casimir. And so what we did, we looked at the Casimir of SUM, we calculated it, and from that, knowing that it's low rank, knowing that it's rank, rank two, in fact, uh, we calculated the dimension of this dominant representation, and we put that into this log to get the entanglements, okay. Um, I'm just going to tell you the answer, but notice that this is a very geometric quantity. If I have the, if I have my, my two sphere and I make a cap here, and if this is M, right, this is N over two, going to the equator, this is M. What this guy is, is this, is the sign of this angle. So this M, N minus M, is equal to n sine theta, where theta is this angle here, okay? It's true. Right? That means what is sine theta is proportional to this, the length of this curve here, right? which is the area of the partition. And so this block has an area, a boundary in it. <clears throat> when you go through this Casimir, I, I'm really need a uh, so let's think of the Casimir as it has an X and a pi squared, basically. Let's expand this out, X, X, pi, pi, right? The Xs have a classical contribution, but the pi's don't, right? And so those you have to calculate using this weight function. The X classicals that end up contributing, that's how this, that's how this, this, this quantity gets into the calculation is from this classical X and that's where this area comes in. So what we show is this entanglement, the log of the dimension of the representation, which we get using uh, representation theory, 
and calculating the customer, calculate the customer using this wave function. So the final answer uh, goes like this. Just to, well, there's no squiggle, it's just, it's a, so just to show you that it's real, I'll, I'll put in the three pi. Okay, there's a lambda, which I'll tell you what it is in a second, over G Maxwell, this coupling that I wrote before. This area over some lambda. And then there's a log correction, uh, which I'll, I'll tell you about in a second. So the, the main technical result of our paper is this, this result for the entanglements, which up to a log, which is just there. Where does this log come from? The dimension of this representation is given in some A choose B, a binomial, some binomial, and the asymptotic limit of this binomial things has, has a log correction. So it's an area law with a log correction, and it has this one over this Maxwell coupling in it. The field theory, suppose you just took the commutative field theory on the sphere, that's looking at the fluctuations for this x. And so in the field theory, you, you, don't, you don't look at this background, it's just the, only the field theory that knows about the fluctuations. And this would give you an area law without this G Maxwell enhancement, okay? So the G Maxwell enhancement comes from the fact that these x's have a, a non-trivial classical background. They build a space for you. The field theory, the commutative field theory, doesn't know about this Maxwell contribution. Okay. A lambda is a coarse gradient scale, and uh, it basically is the statement that when you partition the matrices, um, you have to cut off your L, not at N, but at some lower scale lambda. Okay, and that makes sense because the locality should not, there's this UVIR mixing that, that some of you may know about and, and that you don't want that. So the least is cut off. Okay, so that is the conclusion. So let me just write the conclusion now, stop. So SUM correlations between the region and its complement uh, give you have an area have an area law entanglement <coughs> up to a lock in an emergent space a big all right that's all thanks Let's have one urgent question. And then if you have any more questions, then uh, we can have Sean for the rest of the coffee break. And then later. <laughs> All right, so if there are no urgent questions, then let's keep the questions. I, I appreciate the questions during the talk, thank you.